The museum is very excited to post the Jesus Corner created by Ed and Nancy Keenholtz. It's been a long process and a few years in our dream to, to host the work here, which is uh, part of the collection of uh, <coughs> what was formerly the Cheney Coles Museum, and now the Museum of uh, Northwest Art and Culture. Is that correct? Yeah, that's it. Northwest Museum of Art and Culture. Northwest Museum of Art and Culture. Which they call MAC. <coughs> yeah. Go figure. Uh, as a way of hosting this exhibition, <coughs> and it's been a long time in coming, the museum lent 50 pieces from the Contemporary American Indian Collection, which were hosted at their museum for six months. And in exchange, we were granted access to the Jesus Corner, which has been a long time dream for us to host here. Uh, as you go in there, I, I think that uh, many people recognize the fact that Ed and Nancy are iconic art figures in the American West. And there's uh, a lot of reasons for that. And, and part of the reason is <clears throat> drawing attention away from the East Coast to the West Coast and uh, just the maverick nature of their aesthetic and art approach. Uh, as we began to formulate educational programming to, to kind of uh, frame the Jesus Corner here in Missoula, we looked at uh, the Keen Holtz's connection to Missoula and if there were any. In 1981, they were featured in an exhibition here in Missoula and they were over here. And at that time, Gordon McConnell interviewed them and wrote an extensive uh, article for the Missoula Independent. Uh, so we invited Gordon to come and be part of our speakers bureau and speakers series. <clears throat> and Gordon said yes, and then thought about it for a week and then said no. <laughs> and uh, felt like he did, didn't really have that much to add to the dialogue which he already had written about. We thought it would be really critical to have Nancy come and uh, before we began planning this, uh, the schedule of people to help us frame this work. And uh, Nancy said, yes, I'd like to do that. And then when, as we began to look at the dates, none of those dates seemed to work out for her. And she travels to different locations in the world and uh, apologized and had to take a pass on coming over here. And critical, a critical linchpin in the Jesus Corner going to, at the time, the Cheney Cowles Museum was Beth Sellers. And Beth Sellers is no stranger to our audience here. She was a juror for the Montana Triennial. She's been a respected curator throughout the Northwest and a real advocate for installation art, art on the edge, contemporary art in the Northwest. She's an extremely respected advocate of, for artists in the Northwest. And was also instrumental in steering the Jesus Corner into the collection in Spokane. So we had to have Beth come here and speak to us. And uh, without further ado, I want to introduce, turn this over to Beth, but I also want to mention that there's two more lectures coming up, one by Raphael Chacon and one by uh, Ra uh, Ted Hughes, who will, uh, and those will happen over the next few weeks. So without further ado, I want to turn it over to Beth. Thank you. Um, I'm glad that Steve mentioned a few things like, like uh, his, you know, his, the, an overview of, of Ed and Nancy, because I have, I decided that you probably all have heard a lot about how important he has been universally for so long, or they have been universally for so long. And so I'm, because I wanted to just speak to the Jesus Corner, I'm just, that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to, 
you know, like contextualize him um, in in a bigger a bigger format. Um, the reason that I'm starting with this one is it's kind of for me it's where it all began. Uh, Ed and Nancy would have uh, every summer they would have a gallery opening of some famous artists that they had brought back from Berlin. I had, uh, uh, the first one I went to was when he had George Rickey, but over the years he, he had, um, Bob Helm was the first one who started it, and in fact this is Bob Helm, um, a drawing of him. But he had Jasper Johns, Francis Bacon, Alberto uh, Giacometti, uh, George Rickey as I said, Richard Jackson, Peter Shelton, Emil Nolde, Peter Volkes, John Altoon, Jay DeFeo, Debbie Butterfield, Sam Francis, just to name a few. He, he opened it in 76, he paid for it with a Guggenheim grant that he had gotten. And um, he would only have it open for one month during the summer. And, and that one month was one day a week, and that was three hours for that day. <laughs> But what, what nobody wanted to miss were the events that occurred um, in the, uh, for the opening because the artist was there, he had this wonderful little gallery that they would have some work in, but then there'd be this party and you'd, a lot of people would get to be invited up to the big house to further the conversation in the evening. And so it was, it was like something you did, not, you did not want to miss. Um, so I, that's why I wanted to start it with that because that's when I got to know Ed, primarily Ed, and I keep saying Ed because he was pretty much the one who was really involved in, in wanting to have the Jesus Corner come to the museum. And he, we seem to have, we work together more frequently than Nancy and I did. So if I, if you think that I'm not including her name, it's just because that's where my mindset is, is with Ed. Um, let's see. Do I have to aim it at something? <laughs> Okay, Ed, Ed grew up on this farm in Fairfield, Washington. It was about 20 miles to the south of Spokane. Um, and I, I, I'm going to read this and there will be other segments that I will read uh, simply because they're quotes from him. He's the one who, who told me or provided the writing that describes it. And so I'm gonna not mess with it, I'm just gonna read them. Um, he, he, he said, I would sit there on my stool milking cows, gazing out at the barn door. Off above the hills to the northwest, I could see the great aura, the lights of Spokane, <laughs> glowing in the night sky, and I'd curse those damn cows and tell myself I was going to get the hell out of that smelly old barn. <laughs> I wanted to see what the city lights were all about. I thought anything that bright had to be good. Um, he attended Whitworth College and Eastern Washington University and he worked odd jobs while he was still in Spokane. And, and he worked, in, I'm sure you all know, he worked as an orderly at Medical Lakes uh, Mental Institution and that's where many of his ideas later, uh, that was the genesis of them. Uh, he sold used cars and vacuum cleaners, he managed a dance band, and he owned a bootleg club before he headed off to um, L.A. Okay, let's see if we can get it. Um, in 1953, he went to L.A., he married Nancy. Uh, they went to Berlin in 1973 on a dad grant, uh, D-A-D grant, Star and I would say it, but it's all in German, so <laughs> I would not be able to tell you correctly. Uh, and he started a routine of half the year in Berlin and half the year in Hope, Idaho, which brought an interesting kind of dialogue to both areas. And he, he did that for 22 years, the half year in each, in each place. He was really interested in, in fact, having the artists from Germany come to the States and meet the artists in, in northern Idaho uh, where he lived. So, there was a lot of exchanges that went on. Um, let's see. The, 
the best the the pedicord apps or the pedicord apartments uh, were one of two of the hotels in in Spokane that were already very dilapidated were condemned and in on some of the floors because the upper floors were leaking so bad and Ed uh, had a relationship with Louis Ray who was Louis Ray demolition company in um, Spokane where they when Louis would buy one of these buildings and he would call Ed and say get over here come take whatever ornamentation you want for your pieces so it was a really nice relationship um, and so I will read his description of, of this experience our best source for building the Spokane pieces is Louis Ray, who is building Wrecker Extraordinaire in Spokane. He buys old hotels and apartments, moves the people, usually to a much better quarters, and then demolishes the building for the salvage. He started from scratch a long time ago and has become most successful over the years. Uh, from his warehouse, he can supply anything from used uh, used oak flooring to stuff moose heads. In our case, he took us over uh, to the Petticourt Hotel, which he had just bought. There were still people living on the lower levels, but the top of the building leaked badly, and he told us we, we could have anything we wanted on the upper three floors. Uh, the first room we entered was terrific. It had almost everything we would need for Solly 17 except the bed had a big dried blood stain about three feet in diameter in the middle of it. Someone had either been stabbed to death or had had hemorrhage there. We quietly closed the door and tried the next room. Um, it was pretty much like the first room, sans blood, so we took everything. We pried off the baseboards, giving the cockroaches ample time to escape unscrewed the mirror and electrical wiring channels, unhooked the ceiling fixtures, filled apple boxes with small leftover debris, and in the basement we found at least 200 rolls of new, unused pattern wallpaper. Louis sold us everything for almost nothing. While the Petticourt Apartments was being finished, Nancy and I were busy with the Jesus Corner. And if you look closely, you will recognize the Jesus Corner. Um, years before, we had noticed an incredible naive environment in an old store window at the corner of Bernard and Sprague, kitty corner through the block from the Petticourt Hotel. Someone had decorated the place with the most simple and mundane items imaginable as a personal icon gesture to God. There were religious pictures torn from a calendar, poems about goodness and salvation, aluminum foil, garbage bags, plastic candles, and all assembled in such a gentle and provocative way that a desire to trans transpose the scene into art became an obsession with us. We found out the store was rented to a Roland Thurman and uh, that he had worked at the Crescent department store, which was... Um, it was like Frederick Nelson's, which I think it became Frederick Nelson after that, um, department store as a janitor. The Crescent had no home address for Mr. Thurman. I started driving into Spokane whenever I had the time to try to trace the man down and talk to him. The owner of the building was no help. A monthly rent check always arrived on time, but without, without a return address. The postman who delivered the, main had, or the mail had never seen him. Notes explaining my interest were shoved under the door, but there was never a response. We discussed the problem with Louie, who thought he knew someone who might know where to find Mr. Thurman. He didn't, and we were finally ready to give up and admit defeat. The window got dirtier and dustier and more sun bleached. It became obvious the store was not being used anymore, except as a place of storage. <clears throat> Frustration and failure was nagging at us. Um, and then one morning, late in November in 1982, we got a surprise call from Louis Ray. He had bought the rest of the Petticourt block, had legally advertised his intention to salvage the buildings, and had advertised anyone with personal property to get it out within the month. There was no response from Ronald, Ronald uh, Thurman. 
The month was up and Louie was starting demolition work early on Wednesday. If we still wanted the window, we should get into Spokane and take what we wanted. That was Monday morning and we were in town by noon carefully photographing and documenting the contents and placement of the window components as we dismantled. Oops. Get stuck together. The rest of the store was an even bigger surprise. Uh, it was stacked floor to ceiling with stuff not unlike the Collier Brothers building of the 40s in New York. <clears throat> Excuse me. I really can't describe the unrelated things that took place there. <clears throat> Lots of things from the Crescent, um, new shop-worn shirts on hangers with 49 cent receipts for each, salesman sample cases with Gideon Bibles and maybe a Playboy, a Playboy magazine inside, golf clubs dating back 30 years or so, cardboard boxes full of cardboard boxes. We found a single bed <clears throat> and there is a single bed, believe it or not, underneath that, under a mountain of debris and surmised that Roland had probably lived in the store until his pack rat collections consumed all the available space and he was forced to move out. The place was incredible. My guess is that Thurman was raised during the Big Depression and just learned to keep everything as it would surely come in handy someday. Which brings up a question, who is really wealthier, a Roland Thurman with a store full of perfectly good, serviceable, worthless junk that satisfied his sense and need for possessions? He was a man who owned things. Or you and I with a modest bank account and a life full of different kinds of stuff and possessions. I guess it's all relative. And here is Ed in, in his studio um, back in Hope, Idaho, finishing drooling his, his signature um, drool across the face of it, which you obviously see on the, on the piece. And here he, um, Ed says, I should insert here that on December 3rd, a couple of days after we had gotten what we wanted out of Thurman's place and the Young Hotel, the buildings on that whole end of the block burned to the ground. Probably some winos started a little fire to stay warm, and of course the hole went up like the tinderbox that it was. So why I have all this, why I have all of the, the um, and I hope you can read this letter. I, I can't tell from here, but I hope you're able to read it. Why I have all this writing that then was put into our little catalog that we produced was based on um, my talking Ed into doing a show in the first place. I had been at one of his, his um, functions at the, the gallery, one of his summer functions, and he had, um, before the evening was over, had offered to do a show at, at the Cheney Coles Museum, which, um, of course, I said yes, even though he gave me the dates that he could do it, and I already had a big show that I'd worked on for a year and a half going into there at that time, so I just, I, I collaborated with a place called Touchstone Center for the Visual Arts, and it was a big warehouse in Spokane where we were able to put the big pieces and, and we took the smaller pieces um, in the museum. But um, this letter is an example of how Ed worked. You would ask him for something um, or suggest something and he would immediately say, absolutely, positively no, no under no circumstances. And, but before you would be finished, he would you know, ultimately say, well, maybe, we'll think about it. Uh, and this letter is just a, a really concise example. Are you able to read it from where you are? No. Oh, you aren't? Oh, dear. Um, I'll have to read it for you, because I don't have it written down here. Um, but this is, he wrote it to me from, from Berlin. I think I can read it better on this one. Um, here we go. 
Um, you asked in your letter of January 7, time goes by, if we could write something for the Spokane catalog. Um, absolutely not. Sorry, but I just don't have the time. So that's that. <laughs> About a Spokane piece, the one that should stay in Spokane, I'd already been sort of suggesting that he consider a piece going into the museum. Um, uh, the, probably the Jesus Corner, as it is really the most important of the, of the three works which were remaining. Sally 17 was sold already. Uh, and then he says, um, oh, and then I had sent him some articles about the Keenholz family uh, all being interviewed with the Spokane newspaper um, about, well, Cousin Eddie. Um, and, and he thought that was pretty funny. So he says here, Thanks for all the, the historical stuff and articles that you sent. Funny stuff. All us keynotes are related. Uh, ben was my, was from my father's cousin's side, I think. Uh, oh well, maybe I can find a little time for the <laughs> evolutionary. <laughs> um, <laughs> a statement, but don't get your hopes up. And then he ends with, Europe has some good places to eat. The new type of, the new pastry. something, pastry. Pastry, pastry for me is baked and I think breaded camber, camber uh, cheese with cranberry sauce. Oh damn, I'm, I'm hungry again. <laughs> Gotta run, love Ed, hello from my beloved Nancy. Um, so this is, this is the essay that he said he could not, I, I actually brought it in total, seven pages typewritten of the essay that he said he wasn't going to do. And that, and that became the, the catalog for the, the show. Um, we opened at the same time, well we opened at the museum the first night and the next night with the big work in Touchstone. The media, it was just a frenzy. And he had told me that he didn't do interviews. And so here he was doing interviews. And he's, as he's standing there waiting for them to suit him up with his microphone and stuff, he in his very most serious manner said, I will get you for this. <laughs> <laughs> and then after the opening, we were having Nancy and Ed give a talk to the, to the public. And they had said about 10 minutes before they were to go on. I mean, I, I had talked him into it. In fact, that, that was also something absolutely not, no, he wouldn't think of it. And, and I had met with him and with the person from Touchstone uh, for, several times we'd go up to Hope, Idaho, and we drove up one day in a blizzard and spent the whole day hammering out all kinds of logistics for the exhibition, for how to get these pieces to Spokane. And about every hour I would just sort of suggest that it'd be really cool if, you know, they'd give a talk while this, the shows were up. And Ed would just explode, absolutely just, you know, Every four-letter word, absolutely no, he wouldn't think of it. So maybe an hour or two later, I would again uh, just mention it. And finally, by the end of the day, he agreed to, they would do like 10 minutes of talks. So right before the, everybody, there were about 150 people out on the front, front porch waiting to come in for the talk. Um, he says to me, um, we're smoking. You know, you know, we're going to smoke while we talk. Well, of course, it's a museum, um, and it's got big signs on the wall <laughs> right above where they stood. And I thought, okay, I say no, and then I get to go out and tell 150 people that no, you can't, they're not going to talk because they can't smoke, or I just let them smoke. And so I did. And that 10 minutes, it was just so cool to see because the, the auditorium was packed and smoky, <laughs> but they, the audience was so just hanging on every word that was said. They went on for an hour and a half 
nonstop, just telling stories. And I had only prepared, I had a tape, like just one tape, because it was only going to be just a few minutes. So I, and I, I couldn't get any more. So anyway, the, I, I will show you the um, pieces. This is the piece that he did of his mother, Ella. Uh, and in fact, he filled it with Ella's belongings. They're her memories. She's holding a photograph of herself as a child looking back at her. And inside the, the little cabin, which is supposed to look like um, the cabin she had in Hope, Idaho, um, are all of her things that he took from her. <laughs> and like the chair in front, that was her favorite chair to sit on the front porch with. And he somehow managed to get that for the, oops, excuse me. Um, I'm, I'm afraid I'm jumping ahead because oh, it's jumped. Uh, anyway, these, the previous one that I can't get back to now, and this one were the white easel pieces. Uh, one was white easel with machine pistol. Um, and they were his attempt to familiarize himself with his studio. He had just finished building this big new studio. He had always been in a cramped space. He'd always had low ceilings around him. This studio was magnificent. You could stand inside the big river rock fireplace that he had in, the, in his studio. And the ceilings were really two stories high. And he, as he worked, he could not, he was just not feeling right about the space. And these, this piece and the previous one, you can see there's kind of a gridded thing that is marked off just the same as the, the wall surface in his studio. And he was trying to work out the uh, proportions of artwork based on this studio. Ultimately, he figured out that if he put a floor above his studio where he worked and thought, um, it lowered the ceiling, and then it was all just great. It, and that studio, in fact, then became um, uh, Nancy's studio above. This piece was about child abuse, obviously, and, and Ed enjoyed telling the story that this was actually one of their neighbors. Uh, so the nicest guy you could ever meet, <laughs> but they talked him into being the, the subject for the uh, photograph. So those were, those were all at the Cheney Coles Museum in, in the smaller room. This and the rest of these were in the um, warehouse space, the Touchstone Center for Visual Arts. And this is the exterior of Solly 17 and the interior. And everything about it is from Spokane. Um, the window, in fact, the, the photograph that makes you think you're looking out the window was actually taken from the building down on the, the bank across the street. And this was the, the drawing for Solly 17. Ed always, Ed and Nancy always did the drawing after the piece. It, it, you know, you normally think of working on sketches beforehand, but they always then summed up their, their what they did with a drawing. So this followed Solly 17. Petticoat Apps was um, the, uh, it was this remarkable piece where you, they had made the, the entire hallway diminish in size radically. So as, as you walked in, it looked like it was much longer than it really was. And as you walked in, you could walk all the way to the back, it closed in on you. The ceiling was much lower. The walls were much closer to you. And as you walked along, every doorway had something happening behind it. You could hear a dog barking, or you could hear a television, or you could hear a man and woman fighting. Um, it was, it was a really amazing surround piece. And the night desk clerk um, was also, uh, it, it was done, the last, the last piece that they had done from the petticoat. Um, they, and they just walked upstairs into this hotel. Um, and it, it was, excuse me, it wasn't the petticoat, it was into the young hotel. After they had taken 
all of the Jesus Corner component away from the building. They went upstairs to the Young Hotel to tell Louie they were done and thank you. And they came across this, this desk and it was just like, oh my God, we need to take this away now too. Their assistants were about to fold at this point. <laughs> um, and so the Jesus Corner, um, it, it was also in the, in the exhibition at the, at the uh, Touchstone Center. Um, and Ed, um, he was really close to this one. He is, as I read uh, on the, the note um, to me, he really wanted it to go into a museum. I mean, he felt really close to it. Um, so it, we had kind of a special interest just watch, you know, looking at it, and then we sent it off um, to, oh, and this is some publicity that, you know, opening the vistas of Spokane. Um, the Jesus Corner then went off to the exhibition, the Human Condition um, exhibition that the uh, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art had put together. It was a massive show that toured to the um, Chicago Art Institute too. And this is Henry Hopkins, who was the director of the museum at that time, and then Nancy, and then Rich Post, who was Ed's right-hand person, who did all of the, um, everything fabricated with Ed, and then of course Ed. Um, so now we, we cut forward 10 years. This is in Ed's studio, the Jesus Corner is in the studio, and we are there to pick it up for our collection. Um, and it came about, this is 10 years later, and it came about one morning I, I got a phone call from Peter Goulds, who was the director of the L.A. Louvre, and, and that was, that is, remains the King Holtz Gallery. And he, he said, Beth, I don't know what's going on up there, but Ed just called me and told me to call you and offer the Jesus Corner to you for the Cheney Coles Museum collection. And I don't want you to tell anybody what he wants to charge you because it's so far below the, the actual retail. And I mean, it was far below, it was far above any, <laughs> any of our budget still, but I, I went to my director and said, we got to do it, and he said, "I agree. I'll back you." So, so we did a contract for five years that we would make payments over those five years, and then the day came. It was January eighteenth, I think. Yeah, January eighteenth, nineteen ninety-four, and my assistant and our building manager George and I drove this big flatbed truck up to um, uh, Hope, Idaho, to pick up the piece, and I, I will just show you the images, but I will read to you what Ed wanted to make very clear about his feelings about Roland Thurman and why he thought the piece was done. But I, I want you to, as we, as we go through, Ed, Ed is totally involved in the whole process, and in fact, I should, I should just quickly mention, my, our building uh, our manager person who was driving the truck, this big 18 foot long truck, um, he parked it where he thought he should park it, right outside of, of Ed's studio. And when Ed came out to welcome us, he, he just barked at George to, no, that's not the place, you need to park it over there. And George, um, was German, is German, was German, he's no longer alive. But he, 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 he didn't talk to George that way, and he, he was not like intimidated whatsoever by the importance of this artist. And he marches back to the truck and he pulls it into the place where he was told to do it. And he slams the door on the truck and comes marching back. And Ed, that was like the test. It, all of a sudden, he and George are sharing dirty jokes with each other and clapping each other on the back. So as we go, you'll just kind of see this whole kind of thing. But 
Bear in mind, this is the piece that, that is in the next room um, on its way to a new collection. Uh, so as I go through here, I'll just read what Ed wrote. I want it understood by anyone who sees the Jesus Corner that there is no intention on our part to ridicule the efforts of Roland Thurman in assembling his religious window at Bernard and Sprague. Quite the contrary. My personal philosophy does not include belief in an all-seeing, all-knowing intelligence. I believe, in, I believe in cause and effect and in the scale uh, of how we perceive the earth and universe. I'm confident or I'm content to respect that process and call it nature. However, the initial thing about Thurman's window that compelled Nancy and I to recreate it was its absolute honesty. It was a humble expression of one man's belief and dedication to a supreme being. Thurman wanted all who passed the corner to know where he stood and how he felt about his God. The world could use a lot more Thurman kind of people rather than the hypocrite who prays in church on Sunday and then prays on his neighbors and associates the rest of the week. Um, and then he, he finished that statement by saying, I, I hope you, the viewer, will understand our intention of the Jesus Corner as such. So, I'm not moving again. Here they are telling dirty jokes of each other. <laughs> this thing was getting taller and taller on this track. <laughs> In fact, Ed called when, when, when we got back to the museum, Ed called first thing the next morning and said, you didn't go under any low bridges, did you? <laughs> <laughs> this was our profile. <laughs> and, and that's me thanking Ed. And I, I just love this photo because he was, you don't hug Ed, you know? And he was so stunned, but he knew why I was doing it, was I was so excited that this had happened. And he too was totally excited that it had happened. He was, it was for him, it was like, now it's in place. He had, he had, he and I over the years would talk about a piece coming in and initially he had said, you can have a jerry can piece, you know, one of the jerry can edition. And I'm like, that, that's, that would be a token piece. I would not be a responsible curator if I just accepted a token piece of yours. I, I, like it or not, Ed, we are your museum. Um, you're in the northern, you know, in our part of the, of the country. and. We are your museum. And so that was when it was, you know, determined that, yeah, okay, it will be a major piece. So um, this, the, there was quite a bit of, of, you know, everybody was really happy to see that this had happened. And then six months later, he was gone. And, of course, looking back at that now, um, he was just putting things into place. You know, he, he had diabetes. He had already lost the use of his, of his feet and, and his extremities were not working as well. And so he was putting everything in place. And that's, I mean, I know that's the reason that he called Peter Gould and told him to call me. Um, so we lost, we lost a really amazing person. Um, the William Wilson in the LA Times on June 13th said, Ed was clearly planning to, part the, to depart the planet. He had diabetes and could no longer feel his feet, but commented, I've had a good run, a marvelous life. If it's time to go, I'm not worried about it. And Wilson ended the obituary or the article by saying, it is simply impossible to imagine a history of the American aesthetic without him. So that's, so thank you. <laughs> Did you have any questions or? We've got the next chapter for your slideshow, which is the photographs of 
what it took to get the Jesus Corner <laughs> into <laughs> man. <laughs> because when we did the addition of the front door to man, it was not very big. We knew we would at some point need a larger space. We designed these 10 by 10 foot openings on the alley. And there's metal doors to open to the alley. But it would require removing the wall on the inside. And um, supposedly, it had been built to be removed fairly easily. Steve and a crew found that it was, you know, it was, it was, I think they just got zealous building it and forgot that we were supposed, it was supposed to be removable. It took two or three days just to get that damn wall out of there. And, um, and we had to build a dolly for it and everything. And then, but we did it and then opened it up and brought those pieces in through the alley. And it was quite a quite an installation. Oh, that's wonderful. I mean, it's that's sitting so quietly at the back of the gallery, <laughs> and I keep thinking, oh, you have, you have no idea. <laughs> when we brought that, that truck down and backed it up to our loading dock area, yeah. it was taller than the loading dock to the door. Uh -huh. We had one of those ramps that you could lower, right. and George, who was the master of all technical things, figured out that if we, it was all, it was hard, it was scary as could be, moved it back with the ramp down to just the front part of the ramp, and then we would hold it as he would slowly pull the truck forward. Oh my God. Uh, a little bit. <laughs> and then back it up again so that it would be a little bit further in. It, it took uh, not three days, but it took. <laughs> this, this museum has now been rebuilt, so now there's an awesome loading dock <laughs> underground where you can just look oh, yeah, and yeah. cover and incredible, but not here. <laughs> anyway, we'd like to invite you all to um, come into the gallery, adjacent gallery, and view the Jesus Corner and hang out with Beth a few minutes and have a beverage if you'd like. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you very much, Beth. Oh, thank you. Thank you.